Good evening, everyone. This is Dr. Bill Tulo, Medical Director at Oculus USA. I am really excited tonight to bring to you a webinar titled Optimizing Clinical Use of Bellin Ambrosio BAD Display with Dr. Michael Bellin. Um, some housekeeping, quick housekeeping. If you have questions, please put them into the chat box. We have left time at the end to answer as many questions as we can. I expect there'll be some really good ones from this presentation. I'd like to introduce Dr. Michael Bellin. He's a professor of ophthalmology and vision science at the University of Arizona. He's a chair of the American University Professor of Ophthalmology Fellowship Review Committee and acting chief of ophthalmology for the Southern Arizona VA healthcare system. He's also served as president and vice president for the International Development of the Cornea Society. He's a recipient of the American Academy of Ophthalmology's Honor Award, Senior Honor Award, and Lifetime Achievement Award. With no further ado, it brings me great pleasure to welcome Michael Bellin. Michael, take it away. Thank you. So what we're gonna be talking about tonight is the clinical application of the Bellin Ambrosia display, commonly called the BAD display. And my slides are not moving. There we go. So I always start, no matter what I'm talking on, I always start with some background information or history. So for some of you who've heard me talk before, the beginning will probably be old, old hat. Um, a couple points I want to make. More information is not always better. The use of the placebo-based systems, in addition, to a pentacam or earlier tomographic devices is not needed and actually often is confusing or contradictory. Realize that the bad display is designed for preoperative screening. All the parameters are based on normal eyes. So it's not really appropriate for surgically altered eye, eyes, but this is something we'll discuss later. Also realize it is not specific for keratoconus. It's designed to separate normal from abnormal. So it's not specific for keratoconus without some additional parameters. And again, an abnormal final D does not in itself mean it's a catech or carat keratoconus. I don't know why this keeps popping up in my slides don't advance. So again, I said, first, we're gonna start with some background information really about ele ele elevation tom tomography. And we, we talk about elevation, but realize you actually never see what are true elevation maps. These, these are the raw elevation maps. And if you look at the picture on the left is a normal eye, the one in the middle is a mild keratoconic, the one on the far right is an advanced keratoconic eye. And for the, for the visual inspection, they all look about the same. But realize, while we don't show you this information, because it is not visually, you're not able to visually separate it, this is what the computer uses. So again, if you think about it, no matter how bad an eye is or how advanced a cone, if you were to lie someone down the back and look up at the ceiling, the apex is always gonna be the high point. And that's what you really see, see here. So how do we display the elevation data to make it clinically useful? Well, the most common method is to compare, when we say compare, we're really amplifying the raw elevation data against some common shape. The most common shape used and the most clinically relevant shape, at least for screening for ectatic disease, is a best fit sphere. You can use other shapes. The shape that you use doesn't affect the accuracy of the information, it will change its appearance and it will change how you visually can inspect the surface. And this is what we commonly show. The picture on your left is an astigmatic cornea. Again, the elevation data against a best fit sphere and the flat meridian will be raised above and that's shown here in the plus numbers and the steep meridian will dip below the best fit sphere. So this is a normal astigmatic pattern. When we're looking for ectatic disease, we are looking for what we call a positive island of elevation surrounding by a sea of blue. 
Now, the picture on your right is actually from a patient, but you, I can almost guarantee you will almost never see an eye that looks this pure as far as a positive eyelid develop, ele, elevation. And the reason for that is most keratoconic eyes, in addition to being ectatic, have high astigmatism. So you'll see these eyelids superimposed on an astigmatic pattern. But again, this is a very pure cone. And you can see here again, a positive island of elevation and surrounded by a sea of blue. Now, why do we get this astigmatic pattern? Well, I already kind of alluded to, the flat meridian will be above the best fit sphere that's shown here. And the steep meridian dips down below the best fit sphere. And that's shown by the minus numbers here. But why do we get this pattern for ectatic disease? Again, that positive island surrounded by a sea of blue. Well, if we look at just a cone, and obviously no eye has a, is a pure cone, but if we look at a cone and say, well, how would this cone be compared to a best fit sphere? Look, look, what, look what happens. This is the best fit sphere. The cone is truncated here, and this is all above the best fit sphere. And that's what you see here. And the highest point is the tip of the cone. And that's what you see again, right here. But notice what happens at this sharp transition point. The most negative is not in the far periphery, but in the mid periphery. And that's what you see here with the deeper blue. And that little green that surrounds the transition point is this zero point. So this is why you have a positive island surrounded by a sea of blue. And again, as you go further out to the periphery, you actually don't get deeper blue, but you get actually less. And that's what you see here clinically. Why do we use, and it's standard that our best fit sphere is taken from an eight millimeter zone. Why do we, how did we choose an eight millimeter zone? Well, if you think about the normal cornea, the normal cornea is aspheric. So every normal cornea should show a positive angle of elevation in the center. And if you use the entire cornea, <clears throat> excuse me, as you see here on the far right, that's what you see. You see this positive angle of ele elevation surrounded by a sea of blue. But for visual screening, we do not want every eye to have a positive island. That will not allow us to make a rapid visual screening. And as I said, the normal cornea is aspheric. It's steeper in the center and flatter in the periphery. So as you make that optical zone smaller and smaller, you will steepen that best fit sphere. So notice what happens when we go from the entire cornea to nine millimeters. Nine millimeters shows just a small sense central island. When we go down to seven, it's completely masked. So it turns out just from trial and error that 8.0 millimeter turned out to be the optimal to allow visual inspection without giving false positives or false negatives. So again, the goal of the best fit sphere is to allow us to make a rapid visual inspection. And the only way to separate a true positive island from normal asphericity is to use a smaller optical zone that will mask the normal corneal asphericity. But is that the best reference surface? Well, this is a best fit sphere on an ectatic cornea. And you can see again here, this is the positive island and this is the negative sea of blue right here. But if we're doing the screening, what we would like is to have the most visible positive island possible. What we would like to do is have a reference surface, not like the yellow, but more like the red, because that again will give us a greater positive island, easier to visualize. And how can we do that? Well, we say the regular best fit sphere is calculating using all the corneal data, data within that defined, in this case, eight millimeter op optical zone. And here again is a very good example of a positive island of elevation superimposed on an astigmatic pattern. This is more typical of what you'll see in a keratoconic eye. We have something we call an enhanced reference surface. And the enhanced reference surface uses only the data 
outside the bulk of the cone. And we call that area that we remove the exclusion zone. And then that exclusion one was analyzed by over 1,200 eyes, both normal and keratoconic, looking at ROC curves. We often quote and say, well, the exclusion zone is three millimeters or 3.5. It actually is a number that varies between 3.0 and four millimeters. And it's influenced by the magnitude of the astigmatism. And that's a proprietary formula for the Bell and Ambrosia display. And again, the selection between three and four is done automatically, and that's part of the soft software. So if we can compare the standard best fit sphere to the enhanced reference surface in an eye with ectasia, we notice here again, we go from the standard best fit sphere to the enhanced, we can see again that the cone is more, more visible, has greater ele elevation, easier to visually inspect normalize, and we'll show you this numerically later, don't have a cone, don't have an ectatic region, and when we go from a standard best fit sphere to the enhanced reference surface, there's very little change. So this is an example. This is an eye using the standard best fit sphere. Just so you know what all these marks are. This is the pupil here, and this outer circle here is the eight millimeter optical zone. And you'll notice what looks like an early island here. So you can, you can pick it up, but this now is the enhanced reference surface. Again, the dotted line is the pupil, the outer circle is an eight millimeter zone, and this inner circle is the exclusion zone. And notice what was somewhat difficult to see here becomes very obvious and easy to make a visual inspection. So that enhanced reference surface enhances the ectasia and makes a visual inspection much easier. But just as important is that we don't generate false positives. And here again is a normal eye with the standard best fit sphere. Here is the enhanced reference surface on the front surface, here on the back surface, here using the enhanced. And again, you'll notice there's very little change. So again, going from that standard to enhanced doesn't produce false positives. When we compare the large, that 1200 population I talked about earlier, we, we compared the change going from the best fit sphere to the enhanced reference surface, normal eyes showed a change of less than two microns, while keratoconic eyes on the anterior surface showed a change in excess of 20 mic mic microns. When we looked at the posterior cornea, normal eyes showed a change that was less than three microns, and keratoconic eyes showed a change in excess of 40 microns. And when we show that graphically, again, that had a p-value in excess of 0 0.0001. We can see again that if we look at the change in elevation from the standard to the enhanced reference surface, it's able to differentiate normalized from keratoconic eyes. And that is actually generation of the left side of the Bell and Ambrosia display. The right side is mostly pachymetric data, and that's really Renato's contribution to the Bell and Ambrosia display. And we have two graphs. The graphs effectively tell us the same thing. They're just two ways of showing the data I always look at the bottom one called the percentage thickness increase or PTI, because I think it's just much easier to interpret. The value of the graphs is that it shows pachymetric progression or the change in corneal thickness going from the thinnest point to the periphery. And the reason why that's important is because a single data point, in other words, the apical corneal thickness has very little discriminatory potential. And this is an example here. The upper picture are two eyes that have the same apical or thinnest point thickness. The one on your left, if you look at this tracing here, and what this tracing shows you is a 95% confidence interval for a normal pachymetric change from the thinnest point to the periphery. 
So we all know that when you go from the thinnest point to the periphery, the cornea will thicken. And this shows the rate of change. And if you look at this, it's exactly right down the middle, that in between the 95% confidence interval, a very normal eye. It's a thin reading at the center, but a normal pachymetric progression. Now compare that to the eye on the right. The eye on the right, if you look at the tracing here, it falls well outside that 95% confidence interval. Now, I always kind of make fun of Renato and say he kind of did these backwards um, because an increased rate of change is going down, which is kind of not intuitive, but that's how the graphs are. And you can see here, this is a more rapid rate of change. So we go from the thinnest point to the periphery and a rapid rate of change is more compatible with an ectatic cornea or keratoconus. If we look at the ones below, these are two examples of an edematous cornea. With corneal edema, the edema actually affects the central part of the cornea first, and you lose the normal transition from thinnest point to the periphery. So if you look over here, that graph flattens. There's much less change than normal. And if you look at this picture on the right, which is advanced corneal edema, you will notice not only is it thickened, but notice it's almost a completely flat tracing. So again, the loss of the normal change in pachymetric progression from the thinnest point to the periphery. That led us to our first iteration of the Bell and Ambrosia or bad display. And if you look at the exam date, it's almost embarrassing. It's 2005. This has been in existence now over 15, actually seven, 17 years. So this was the first iteration. We showed you the anterior elevation here using the standard eight millimeter best fit sphere. This was the posterior elevation, standard eight millimeter. This was the enhanced reference surface. And notice that little yellow becomes a little more obvious here, but notice the central island becomes much more obvious here. Again, it accentuates the ectatic region. The bottom, and I, always keep asking Oculus to kind of change this. These are not maps. They're just the numerical difference between this, the enhanced reference, and the best fit sphere. These are the equivalent of, I'm going to try to back up a second, the equivalent of this graph. And actually, I would have preferred if it actually showed up as a graph. Because again, these are not maps. But you can see again here, the posterior surface is highly abnormal. You can see here we have a little displacement of the thinnest point. And here, while we, our tracing is still within that 95% confidence interval, notice that it's, it's trending down again. So a little sus suspicious. The second version, again, that first version had no interpretation. It just gave you the maps and gave you the graphs. The second iteration, reported five what we call D values, which are the individual standard deviations. There was what we call DF, which was the change in that anterior elevation going from the standard best fit sphere to the enhanced reference surface. DB, B stood for back. And that was again change going from the standard best fit sphere to the enhanced on the posterior surface. TDP was the pachymetric progression. DT was the actual just thinnest point, and DY was the displacement of the thinnest point. And each of these parameters were independently calculated based on established normal values. And this is what they showed up on the bottom. Again, DF, DB, DP, and DT, and DY. The individual D values were reported as standard deviations, and they were color coded that at 1.6 standard deviation, they turned yellow, and above 2.6 standard deviations, they turned red. Then there was an overall final reading, which was done by a regression analysis. It is not the average of all five of these parameters. Each of these parameters has a different weighting. And the final D is an overall reading of the entire map. So if we look at again, again, we're still talking about the second iter iteration. 
If we look at, again, this is a four map refractive and this is the bad display, a thinnest point displacement. You'll notice here that the thinnest point, or you can look here also, is just slightly displaced and it shows up as a yellow. Everything else is completely white or normal. And if you look at the final overall reading, it's well within the normal range. It's a very normal eye. This is one that shows more significant thinnest point displacement. You can see here, the thinnest point is actually red, so it's over 2.6 standard deviations from the norm. But look at the overall reading. It's still, well, it's still a completely normal eye. As it turns out, the displacement of the thinnest point was a very minimally weighted parameter, and actually we eliminated it in the third iteration, and we'll show you that later. Here's one that has post borderline posterior elevation. You can see again a little yellow here. The only abnormality here is a slight yellow, but again, the overall reading is completely normal. And here's one that has more significant posterior ele elevation. You can see a, a mild change in the anterior surface, uh, definitely more abnormality in the posterior surface, and an abnormal final D of 2.45. So again, significantly outside the normal range. And advanced keratoconus <clears throat> that you would pick up even just from looking at the format here, but here you'll see every parameter is abnormal except for one, and again, we're still looking at the second iteration. And the one that's not abnormal is displaced from a thinnest point because this is a, a, a nip, nipple cone. And the thinnest point is pretty much right, right in the center. But again, you can see the overall reading is over seven standard deviations from the norm. That brings us up to the third and the current version of the bad display. The third iteration added, in addition to eliminating dy, that displacement of the thinnest point, it added four additional parameters. Elevation at the thinnest point, both on the anterior surface and the posterior surface. And that's shown, if you can follow my pointer, this is front elevation at the thinnest point, this is back elevation at the thinnest point. We added k max. We added k max strictly because people asked us. It is a very low weighted parameter, but K max is shown right here. And we added ART max, which is shown over here, and that's uh, ambrosia relational thickness. Now there's a number of other parameters. You'll see K1, K2, uh, ART min, average, but they don't enter into the regression and, and analysis. The other big change is we added hyperopic data. And I'll show you why later, but you'll notice here, and I believe that this has actually been corrected in the most recent software release. Normal is not normal. It's meant to be myopic eyes, and hyperopic eyes are hyperopic and mixed sill. So if any meridian is hyperopic, you should use the hyperopic database. In addition, we give you the option to turn off the color coding for the individual parameters, but not the final overall reading. And the reason for that is some physicians, and I showed you an earlier example where you can have one parameter in yellow, or even one parameter in red, but the overall reading is normal. Um, some surgeons prefer not to have, quote, a red blinking light for a potential lawyer when the overall reading is, is completely normal. So you do have the ability to turn off the colors for the individual parameters, but not the overall reading. If you do that, you have to pay attention to the numbers themselves. So the, the colors make it much easier to actually look, look at the map. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, why did we add a separate database for hyperopic eyes? Well, this was our original myopic screening, and our original database was all based on myopic patients. And if we look at the anterior thinnest point at two and stand, three standard deviations, and we look at the posterior six and eight and 13 and 18, and now if we look at the same information on hyperopic eyes, you'll notice that the numbers are much greater. 
hyperopic eyes, let's look at the posterior surface, two and three standard deviations, as opposed to, uh, let's see if I can put it, as opposed to 13 and 18 or 22 and 28. So a huge difference. So we generated a separate hyperopic database for your hyperopic patients. And again, I wanna stress the use of the hyperopic database is for any meridian that's hyperopic. So that includes mixed cylinder patients. So what were the improvements made to the BAD3? Again, I said we added four additional parameters, the hyperopic database. Additionally, if you look at it, you'll notice all these yellow triangles. If you click on the yellow triangle, you'll get a drop-down explaining what that parameter is and also usually what normal values are, and the ability to turn off the colors for the small d parameters. There's an enhanced regression analysis, and the new parameters in that formula are shown, shown here. So here you'll see, again, as I, I mentioned earlier, we actually show you a lot more parameters that are not all in the regression analysis. This is Kmax, again, K1, K2. Here, again, you'll see all the different parameters, front elevation thinness, back elevation thinness, the pro progression index, min, average, and ART max, the same graphs as before. And if you notice the parameters here, instead of dy, we have da, which is now ambrosia relational thickness. The one that's often overlooked, and I think I have a slide after this, that you need to look at is this number here. This diameter tells you how much of the cornea you have analyzed. And again, we say that you need an eight millimeter to, cr to create that best fit sphere. So this number will actually turn yellow if it's less than eight, but at 7.5 or greater, and will turn red if it's below 7.5. I've not seen a, a clinical decision that was incorrect when it's yellow, but if it's red as much as you can, you should try to re re repeat the map. And this is an example of why we added the hyperopic database. This is a hyperopic patient, but we've left it in, quote, the myopic database. Notice the back surface is yellow, and we have a slightly abnormal map at 1.66. But when we click on the hyperopic database, notice what happens. It's a completely normal map. So you want to make sure you're using the appropriate database for your analysis. Here is an example, the way it defaults, where the color is left on. As I said, some physicians prefer not to have quote, what looks like an abnormal reading when the overall final reading is very normal. So you do have the ability to turn off the colors on the all the individual parameters, but again, not the final ov overall reading. And this is a good example. You'll notice all these little yellow triangles on the corner of every single parameter on the graphs, on all these, if you click on these, you'll get an explanation, a detailed explanation of what those parameters are. So the BAD3 demonstrated also incremental improvements over prior versions. I already said it utilizes four new parameters. It demonstrates the ability to detect early keratoconic anastasia missed by conventional placebo tech technology. And if we compare version two to version three. This is version two. This is version three. And you may look at it and go, wow, that's not a big difference. For those of you who are familiar with ROC curves, this is actually a very significant improvement because it's very difficult when you get up towards that 90, 95% area to make improvements. This is actually a fairly significant improvement. So that was the background. So how do I put this to practice? Actually, this is the slide I was talking about earlier. So it's important to know everything that the map tells you. And as I said here, often overlooked is the importance of this here, which again, tells you how much of the cornea is analyzed. And you can see here it's red because it's only reading a maximal of 4.54. That should tell you that this is an inadequate exam that needs to be repeated. I already told you again, this is 
the standard enhanced, standard best fit sphere, the enhanced. This is the difference going from standard to enhanced. These are the pachymetric graphs. Uh, this is the pachymetric map. So there are times, however, that no matter how many times you try to look at, try to image the patient, you may not be able to get even 7.5. Now, most, most technicians should be able to, but sometimes you can't. So the question then is, how do you interpret the map? Well, below 7.5, most of the left side of the map is really not valid any longer. Well, what's important is not whether the eye is normal. I'm sorry, it's whether the eye is abnormal, not, not a good candidate. And if you look at the tracing over here, the pachymetric tracing, the loss of data shows up by the dotted lines here. And if you notice, the coverage is only 4.54. And you notice where do the dots kind of start? At about 4.54. But notice this tracing here, the beginning tracing. This is still valid data. And you can immediately tell, I don't really care what's going on here. This is highly abnormal. So even though I may not be able to get a good image on this person, I know it's not a candidate for refractive surgery. It's a highly abnormal eye. So as I said, it's optimal to have at least 8.0 millimeters corneal coverage on both anterior and posterior. You'll almost always have more coverage on the anterior surface, as you can see here. The quality check will turn yellow if it's less than eight, but greater than or equal to 7.5. And as I said, I've not really seen a clinical misreading with yellow but it'll turn red if it's below 7.5. You can see here, they're both very well below 7.5. And as much as you can, you should repeat the exam if you see red in corneal coverage. And this is just a blow up of what I showed you earlier. Even though this side is not valid, you're able to tell that this is an abnormal eye and not a candidate for refractive surgery because the tracing is so abnormal here, and it's solid, which means this is valid data. As I said before, you may have individual yellow or red, but an overall final D that's within the acceptable range. You need to use other information to make a final clinical decision. Both the age of the patient, the ablation depth, the family history, and asymmetry. A lot of times I'll get questions, well, one eye is abnormal, if the other eye is normal, can I do refractive surgery not one eye? The answer should be no. You don't have an abnormal eye, you have an abnormal patient. So I have a big B, B it should be B aware. My practice part guidelines are individual and may not be applicable to different geographic regions, ethnicities, or equipment utilized. Some of them I'm about to present are my personal preferences and not necessarily supported by defined studies. So these are my general, I have to stress the word general LASIK guidelines. I rarely do refractive surgery on patients less than 21 years unless needed for occupational reasons. And that's just my personal bias. I do not do LASIK with a thinnest pre-op pachymetry of less than 495. And that's, again, not an apical reading, but the thinnest point. And I'm the first to tell you it is not supported by any data. It's just my, my practice. I do not use ultrasound pachymetry. I use basically the thinnest point from the Pentacam. And I do not use and probably have not used for 15 years placido imaging. I really only look at the bad display, to be honest, but I always print out the format refracted because others expect it to be there. I use a minimum 300 micron residual bed based on the thinnest pachymetry and the femtosecond setting. And when I started off, I was using the interlace, and I found the interlace was much more variable than the wave light. So actually my femtosecond setting, I added two standard deviations. Effectively, I added 20 microns to the intralace settings. With the wave light, I just actually use the setting because I find it uh, much closer to the actual setting. And I use the computed ablation depth. And as I said, 
I use a minimum of 300 micron res residual bed. I vary what I find as an acceptable final D based on the patient's age. For patients younger than 30 or 30 and younger, my final D limit is 1.6. For patients 30 to 35, and this is just my clinical practice, 1.8, 35 to 40, 2.0, and for patients over 40 years, a final D of 2.2. I'm more liberal in patients over the age of 55. I'm more liberal with surface ablation. I wanna stress, now twice as bolded, this will vary greatly by geography, ethnicity, and your equipment. Um, as most of you know, corneal thickness will vary by eth ethnicity. Um, so this is just what I use as my parameters. Those numbers that I gave you are actually just bracketing, but this is kind of a graph I use, which is, is an age-adjusted final D. This is something I've actually I've asked Oculus to actually put into the bad display, but has not been done. And what you will see is an age-adjusted final D increases the risk score below the age of 30 and decreases the risk score above the age of 32. How did I come up with this? Purely on clinical data and years of experience. But interestingly, for those of you who are familiar with Renato's work with the TBI, the TBI is a combination of biomechanical and tomographic data. But one thing the TBI also does, it has an age factor. And I was very surprised, but very pleasantly surprised, when I looked at my clinical chart, uh, sorry, clinical chart here, and then I plugged in a number of things from the TBI varying the age. What I found is the graphs were completely parallel. So the Renato's TBI age factor effectively mimicked perfectly my clinical age factor. So it's, it's, a, it's a validation of my earlier clinical determination of age as a risk factor. Now, I said earlier that the bad display is for preoperative screening, not postoperative evaluation. <clears throat> and the reason for that is here you can see a very abnormal scan, but that's because it's a postmyopic ablation. You'll notice again here, flattening accentuated here. You'll see an abnormal pachymectric progression because you've thinned the cornea, an abnormal thinnest point again because you've thinned the cornea. Lots of abnormalities because, again, you've surgically altered the cornea. Matter of fact, the only thing on the bottom that is not abnormal is the posterior surface. And that's a very important point. When you do surface ablation or LASIK, you alter every parameter except you shouldn't alter the back of the cornea. So again, you'll see changes on the anterior surface, changes in pachymetric progression, changes on the thinnest point, changes on ART max, but the posterior cornea should be un unchanged. So how do you use or can you use the bad display to do postoperative evaluation or early detection of postoperative actasia? Well, you can't look at the anterior surface because it's been surgically altered. And changes on the further changes on the anterior surface would be a late sign. You can't look at the pachymetry pac map because, again, you've surgically thinned the cornea. You need to look at the posterior corneal surface. So the only part you can really look at is this one column here. This is what you can look at to determine whether you have postoperative ectasia. And here you can see a definite abnormal posterior cornea. There's only one problem with this. This is particularly if you get referred in patients that are not your own. What you won't know is whether this person basically relied preoperatively on placebo imaging and actually dismissed an abnormal posterior surface, or whether this represents a true ectatic change. So again, as I say here, the difficulty is if you don't have a preoperative map, like in a referral case, you don't know if this is a tactic change or was missed by 
inappropriate preoperative screening, i.e., the surgeon, the prior surgeon just looked at the anterior corneal surface. The best way, however, to look for early postoperative refractive change is with the compare two exams looking at the posterior surface. Again, the earliest change on almost everything will be on the posterior corneal surface. So the best exam is to compare two exams. Its use, however, can be a little bit conf confusing. So <clears throat> this is a compare two exam on anterior curvature. I always, and this is just how I'm used to doing it, I always put the most recent exam here and the preoperative, if you have an exam here. And this is a myopic ablation, and you notice what happens. You have a flattening on the anterior surface, which is what you anticipate. Here is looking at the posterior cornea. Again, most recent, preoperative, and the difference. And I'm going to tell you, and I'll show you later, that this is an, a, a, a cornea that does have post-refractive ectasia. But why are we not seeing it on the posterior cur curvature? Well, the reason for that is the posterior curvature is a low power minus lens. It's low powered in diopters because as opposed to an air aqueous interface, it's a cornea aqueous interface. There's very little change. So curvature on the posterior cornea is very insensitive. I'm saying it before my slide. Because the posterior cornea is a low power minus lens, the use of curvature is not sensitive. That's why you should look at elevation for posterior change. And this now is a compared to exams on a uh, basically normal eye, normal postoperative eye. Again, see very little change. But while you do that, I want you to notice one thing. And this is where it gets a little confusing, though most of the time it doesn't really make a clinical difference. Notice the best fit sphere here is 6.31 radius of curvature, and here it's 6.4. Technically, if you're going to compare, you should use the same reference surface between two exams. And if you right click, left click, sorry, in this area, you will open up a drop down menu. And you'll notice here it says change reference shape in all exams. If you click on that, it will adjust the reference surface in both exams to be the same. Again, you click on this and notice now 6.31, 6.31. And now you're using the same reference surface. And notice there is a slight change in the difference now. So, Screening for refractive surgery, the BAD-3 allows for a high specificity and sensitivity. Additional testing with placido is not necessary. And I'll be honest with you, I sometimes get sent, I, I get often get sent. There'll be a Pentacam, a Galilei, an OCT, a placido, and they're asking, and they go, black out. And they'll look, well, why are they different? Well, because they if you do different things from different machines, you're going to see some different values. And also, um, the validity of some machines, particularly like the orb scan, which is really an outdated system. So I, I rely on one system. It's better to have reliable data from one than questionable data from five. Again, consider age, ablation, family history, stability, and always remember to compare both eyes for asymmetry. I always use glaucoma as a good example. You know, if someone comes in with a pressure of 20 in both eyes, you're not overly concerned if everything else is normal. But if they come in with a pressure of 12 in one and 20 in the other, even though technically they're both normal, that high asymmetry is not normal. So again, always look at asymmetry. Excessive asymmetry in itself is a red, fl red flag. And I, we left some time for questions if we have any i think bill will be taking over dr tulo 
All right, fantastic, Michael. Great presentation. Um, I do have some questions. Um, the first question I have, you really kind of answered it, but I'm going to ask it so we can just reiterate it because I think it's an important point. The BAD display is designed for untreated corneas. If I have a new patient post refractive surgery and I use the compare to display to monitor the back surface, and I don't have the baseline pre-op scan, um, what would you consider in my, I guess in microns, a significant change on that back surface to be concerned about? Um, that answer will be interesting, but uninformative, uninformative, whatever. And that is, I probably don't know. And that's because one is nowadays, there's very, very little post-LASIK ectasia. So the numbers are low. And most of the cases that um, do have post-LASIK ectasia didn't have tomography pre preoperatively. Right. Um, I'm only aware of, and I'm sure it's just not, I'm not aware of them. I'm only aware of, I think, one or two cases in the last 17 years since the bad display that I'm aware of that had a normal bad and developed post-LASIK ectasia. A lot of times they'll say they have tomography, but I look at it and they were grossly abnormal to begin with. So unfortunately, I can't give you a set number on that. Okay, well, that's good to know since there are people out there suggesting certain cutoffs that I haven't seen any any studies or, or data to support. So if you're so telling the, me that. Yeah, I, the one thing I would tell you is, um, and this is this is actually what I recommend also on the progression display, which is not what we discussed today. But unless you see huge changes, do at least three exams. Um, and a consistent change for the worse is to me more important than a, a quote number from one to two. Excellent point. You mentioned early on, Michael, that um, there, um, the design of the BAD is for abnormal versus normal corneas. So uh, what other uh, pathologic conditions besides keratoconus could result in the abnormal final D? I know you mentioned uh, Fuchs dystrophy or corneal edema specifically. Yeah, corne corneal edema, any post-refractive, post uh, almost any thinning dis dis disorder. Um, so I want to say that. So when we use the bad display, let's say for an entrance criteria for a keratoconic study, we usually combine the final D with uh, elevation value on the posterior surface because that's something you won't see in corneal edema, you won't see it in corneal thinning. So it can be used, but you can't just look at that final D because again, that will just to tell you how abnormal it is. So you have to look at some additional parameters which you'll define as your inclusion criteria for a, a study. Certainly conditions like keratoglobus and, and pollution degeneration yep. will show up as abnormal also. Excellent. Um, all right, I'm just looking through the list of questions here. I've got one more question here. Does a yellow uh, sub D P value, so uh, pachymetric progression uh, deviation, can that be an indication of future ectasia? So um, I, I, I'll let you take that. When you say f um, <clears throat> any abnormal parameter can be an indicator of future ectasia, so you want to follow it. Of the parameters, and again, people always ask, the regression analysis is proprietary because otherwise everyone can duplicate all of uh, right. The parameters that are the most heavily weighted are progression, pachymetric progression, and posterior cornea. So those would be the things you really, as far as want to look at very early. You know, changes on the anterior surface are late. Um, the anterior surface is, is a heavily weighted parameter, but it occurs late. Um, it's kind of a, one of my earlier talks where I tried to explain this to people, I, I used uh, obesity, mm -hmm. high, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and asystole as far as risk factors. And asystole is almost 100% sens sens sensitive, but it's a horrible screening device. 
because you're dead. Um, so mm -hmm. late, late changes can be very heavily weighted, but they don't have early predictive value. So pachymetric progression and posterior cornea are the earlier indicators of ectatic change. I have a good question that just came in. Um, it seems like older patients uh, being studied uh, in the practice, being, I guess being screened with the Penicam, more often look abnormal. Um, example, when evaluating a pseudophagic patient for possible LASIK enhancement, do you see this also? Is there a reason for this? Um, I don't, well, okay. I don't want to say I don't see it, but again, realize that our acceptability values increase dramatically as you get older. Uh, and most of your pseudophakes are going to be well above the 50, 55, or at least the vast majority of them. Um, so slight elevations in a final D will not be unusual, and nor will it be clinically relevant. Um, so I will add to this question. I'd like you to comment on it. One of the things that I notice on patients, and oftentimes because they're central cornea, they're losing endothelial cell count, their central cornea is getting thicker. Correct. Um, you'll see occasionally some back elevation uh, abnormalities that combined with a flattened out PTI Correct. graph. If, if you have a flattened eight. PTI graph, you will almost always see some changes on the posterior surface, and that's correct. Yes. Yeah, so again, what, that's one of the reasons why if you see uh, overall final reading, but your pachymetry is high, uh, and you, know, you have a, flat, a slight flattening, and you have a little change in the posterior surface, those are just normal variants. And again, you'll see that in the elderly population. Yeah, I, I don't use the word elderly anymore since my pedicans look like yeah, that. Yeah, I, so I know. Mature, okay, mature in, the, <laughs> in the right, we'll use that term. Um, all right, we have another question here. Um, interesting. Have you found more post-op ectasia depending on the altitude? Um, since I only work at one altitude, <laughs> I personally have not. Um, that's very interesting because of you know the the past history of RK at alt altitude. Um, right. I am not aware of anything in the literature that doesn't mean it doesn't exist, um, but I am not aware of it. Uh, I do know that the military was doing some work at elevations and there are changes, but I don't know if those changes were compatible with what we would normally describe as a taser. So right, I, I, I know I there are, there's, the been, there's been reported IOP differences in elevations, which can obviously yeah. change the shape of the cornea. So, but I haven't seen any good, good research or papers showing what those changes would look like but it wouldn't so it wouldn't shock me if there was we're talking significant altitude differences if um if there could be changes in the cornea that could occur you know with with rk we're all aware of both the military and the mountain climbers dramatic changes in visual acuity that has not been reported to my to my knowledge whether there are changes in shape do not know and part of that reason is visual acuity was obviously very easily clinically tested it's not easy on the top of Mount Everest to do a pentacam. Not, I don't mean to make fun of it, but it's just, it's no, a more involved, yeah, it's just hard, 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 hard. Not an easy mobile device to bring up there. Yeah. I have a question for you. One of the things you talked about, but we didn't go into depth about, is differences in thinness points between right and left eye. Right now, the, the pentacam can't automatically do that calculation. Can you tell me a little bit about how you look at that and what concerns you? Yes, and I published a paper on that. And I'm gonna probably, I may misquote my data, but I think 22 or 23 micron difference between the two eyes was like a three standard deviation abnormality. And I think 17 was two. But if you do a Google search, um, it's, a, it's a paper I did with Steve Kachikian uh, way, way back. Um, but we actually did publish two and three standard deviation differences. and Three standard deviations is my cutoff by CA symmetry, and two standard deviations on a symmetry and thinness point is, uh, I don't want to call it a red flag, but a darkly yellow flag for me. But 
20, 22 or 23 micron difference to me is an exclusion between uh, for refractive surgery. But I would I would have to go back and look my act, actual numbers. But it is a calculation you look at on, on yes. when you screen a patient. Excellent. Yes. All right, one more question and then we'll wrap it up for tonight. Um, let me just see what we have here. Just make it an easy one. Uh, yeah, I'll throw you a, okay. a, a, lot, a <laughs> lot here. Um, we've answered that, we've answered that. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna give you one of my own. Um, since I have limited experience, I'm curious to what your thoughts are uh, regarding SMILE. I know you, you have more tolerance for PRK. With the, the evidence coming out uh, with the biomechanical destabilization of SMILE compared to both LASIK and PRK, when someone sends you uh, uh, a Penicam to evaluate and they tell you they're considering SMILE, how do you advise people with SMILE? Um, more like PRK, more like LASIK, or somewhere in between? So. You know, when Smile first came out, they said, well, you know, it's significantly more stable, more similar to PRK. And I think that has somewhat, that claim is somewhat diminished. As you probably know, the penetrance of Smile in the U.S. is minimal, to say the least. Um, so I don't have any personal experience. There is some biomechanical data that it is, um, less of a problem than lace lace sick so yes i would usually since i don't have any personal experience that usually i would give them my criteria to like lasik which is what i do for prk because we don't do you know us again prk represents a small portion of patients also and just say however with prk and or smile you can be more liberal and i have to leave it up to the individual surgeon to make that clinic clinical decision we well, don't have we we still don't have enough patients clearly in the U.S. that have smile to generate any reliable data. Excellent. Well, Michael, we're coming up on the hour. I want to thank you so much. I uh, always learn uh, many things when you give this lecture and presentation, even though I've seen it before. I always learn something new. I want to thank you so much for your time tonight, and I wish everyone else have a great evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good night, everybody.